This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Ledger, now accepting pre-orders for the all-new Ledger Blue Developer Edition, a Bluetooth and NFC touchscreen hardware signing device. Learn more about the Ledger Blue at ledgerwallet.com and use the discount code EPICENTER to get 10% off your first order. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Meher Roy. <coughs> Today we are going to talk to the Tendum and team who are building uh, who are building a consensus engine and black blockchain platform. We're going to be talking to the founders uh, of Tendermint, and they are Jay Kwan, Dustin Byington, and Ethan Buchmann. So before we start our interview, we'd, we'd like to have introductions from all three of them, perhaps starting with Jay. Jay, can you give us your intro and background? Uh, my name is Jay Kwan. Um, I uh, uh, am the founder, co-founder of uh, Tendermint, and uh, I started this project in 2014 uh to uh solve a long-standing problem in um uh, in consensus algorithms in cryptocurrencies and uh today uh we're all evolving this to become a general blockchain platform and uh very excited to be here dustin your intro hi everyone my name is dustin byington i'm a uh, blockchain entrepreneur uh, my first endeavor in the space was a project called uh, satoshi talent it's a blockchain recruiting um firm and um through that, I became introduced to Jay Kwan and uh, immediately realized the, uh, the value of Tendermint and jumped on board. And uh, it's been uh, moving quickly ever since. And finally, Ethan. Hey, I'm Ethan Buckman, or as Mayor correctly pronounced it, Buchmann. Um, I am uh, consider myself an internet biophysicist. I studied biophysics and was infatuated with uh, the self-emergent properties in some natural systems. And then Bitcoin struck me as another example of one of these systems, uh, and I became infatuated with that and very quickly wanted to improve on it and find superior ways for it to foster self-organization among humans. And so far, the best way I know of doing that is something like Tendermint, which I discovered um, about a year ago and have been working closely with Jay on ever since, um, mostly in the, in the context of working for Ares, who also builds uh, blockchain applications on top of Tendermint, and now more directly uh, with the new Tendermint organization. Cool. So let's start with the with the interview. Uh, we'll be covering a lot of themes. How, like, what is Tendermint? Uh, what kind of smart contracting system they're trying to build, and the applications that could result out of it. But first, uh, perhaps Jay, you could answer what made you start Tendermint, and what problem are you trying to solve here? Uh, sure. Uh, in 2014, um, I was uh, part. I uh, took part in the massive uh, rise and uh, a subsequent qu crash of Bitcoin in uh, 2013 and 2014. Of course, it's the price has come back up now. But uh, at the time, um, as the price was rising and everybody was super enthusiastic about the uh, possibilities of Bitcoin, um, I did some knack and calculations uh, that led me to believe <clears throat> that. Given the reward schedule of Bitcoin um, and uh, the, the potential price increase, uh, should Bitcoin uh, gain global dominance as a cryptocurrency, um, it would have a huge environmental impact and the price of uh, securing that ledger would be enormous. Um, of course, a lot of people disagree and uh, there's, you know, it's, it's argued both ways. But either way, I set out to search for uh, better consensus algorithms, something that uh, wouldn't require the energy footprint. And um, I tried and failed many times, but one day when I was reading a, a paper on Byzantine fault tolerance from 1988, uh, everything started to click and I realized um, that classical BFT algorithms from academia could be adopted to uh, secure a blockchain. And uh, not only is it uh, more energy efficient, um, it, Turns out, and this is something that I've realized after, um, it turns out that it's much faster and uh, to commit transactions, it's scalable. Um, you can run parallel blockchains and also um, it's uh, potentially much more secure because it doesn't rely on the, uh, you know, we can talk about it later. But uh, so that's how I got started. I wanted to create a, a plausible competitor to Bitcoin to, uh, to make sure that we don't end up in some uh, dystopian hellscape. And uh, but today, what we're doing now is uh, is a little pivot from that. We're taking the code base 
we're taking the engine that we've created and we're creating a general platform, not just a cryptocurrency, but a blockchain agnostic platform. And a really fascinating one. And, and, and so I personally, I just learned about Tendermint a few weeks ago and uh, I'm in, interested in, you know, how it works. In fact, you know, we, we're also thinking about using it at Stratum. And what, what's interesting about what you just said is that I think that for most people, including myself, we sort of have this idea that Byzantine fault tolerance just sort of started existing when Bitcoin was created or, you know, don't really conceive that uh Practical uh, Byzantine fault tolerance exists since you know there's been research on this since the 80s, um, and uh, the fact that it's only sort of coming to fruition now, and that we now have open source systems that allow us to 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 to, to implement it is is really fascinating. That you know how, that's how long it takes uh, for these technologies to evolve. Yeah, you know, um, just a few months ago, I heard uh, that uh, somebody say this in a, a Bitcoin conference and. They expressed uh, the same um, misunderstanding that uh, Bitcoin was the first implementation of a BFD algorithm, but that's absolutely not the case. Um, but uh, to be fair, Bitcoin may very well be the most, uh, the first, most widely adopted BFD um, application. Um, uh, absolutely. And so, how has Tendermint evolved since uh, you first started it uh, over a year ago? Um, we started off with. Um, uh, a cryptocurrency application. So it was meant to be uh, uh, public, permissionless, but uh, uh, non-proof of work cryptocurrency. Um, and then when we discovered uh, Ethereum, we decided, hey, Ethereum's virtual engine is pretty good. Uh, virtual machine is pretty good. Let's implement it. And we did that. And then we met with, uh, along with Eris and Ethan, we uh, created a uh, uh, permission system on top, uh, integrated a permission uh, uh, system into Ethereum's virtual machine, uh, and uh, that was just a few months ago. Uh, recently, uh, we've evolved to become uh, something a little more different. Uh, we're taking, you know, we realized that uh, the blockchain uh, that we were creating was this uh, monolithic stack um, where everything compiled down to one program, and, and it makes it difficult for uh, application developers, blockchain developers to create new blockchain applications. So we're splitting that and making it more modular uh, so that uh, we can, this, this engine that we've created can accommodate many applications. Um, and uh, part of that is a network protocol called uh, TMSP. So Tendermint Core, the blockchain engine, speaks to the blockchain application via uh, a network protocol called TMSP, and together they are a blockchain. Okay, well, we'll, we'll talk about TMSP in just a second. First, uh, can you? I mean, I guess one in one of the ways in which it's different from from Bitcoin is that you know, like you mentioned, it, it's it's modularized. It doesn't have all the code in, in one um, in one application, one code base. Can you tell us about other ways in which? Uh, and obviously the consensus mechanism, which is different, um, which we'll talk about during, uh, in the show, but other ways in which Tendermint is fundamentally different from Bitcoin or Ethereum. Besides the consensus algorithm? Well, um, Ethan, what do you think? So there's a, there's a bunch of things. Um, so one, it's got, uh, at least in, in our opinion, um, superior design from the perspective of light clients, at least. Uh, part of this is, is just a proof of stake thing. Proof of stake like clients are easier to implement than proof of work because proof of work, the like client still has to catch up on all the work that was done and sort of process all the headers. Whereas in proof of stake, as long as they come online once every few months or six months, they can just sort of jump right up to the most recent state. Um, but and part and parcel with that is the fact that the the application state has a, a Merkle root hash that is stored in the block so that you can prove the state of any any substate of the whole state. Bitcoin doesn't really have this. There's a lot of talk in the Bitcoin community about things like fraud proofs and, and different ways to prove something about the current state of Bitcoin. And the design of Bitcoin was never really such that that could be facilitated. Um, interesting things are happening now with the segregated witness proposal that I'm sure everyone has heard about that should make these things more feasible. But there's a lot of sort of like beating around the bush to get there, right? Um, whereas we've, we've had it built in. I mean, Ethereum was possibly the first to do this in, in blockchain land, and we sort of originally copied a lot of Ethereum's design in terms of account structures, um, 
and in in terms of the importance of the state the state route. Um, but now, since the application has moved outside of the core blockchain, we don't we don't force you to do anything except return a state route if you want, so that you can support like clients. So now, in in terms of the difference, aside from you know the core consensus, the difference is up to you. So you could implement. Bitcoin, I mean, if the Bitcoin devs have done a good enough job on their code base in terms of modularity, you can take the pieces of the Bitcoin application state, which is basically, you know, uh, transaction processing and Bitcoin scripting language and the UTXO set and run that as an application on top of Tendermint, right? Put that in its own container and have it talk TMSP to Tendermint. So if you want to do that, you're free to do that. And then you have exactly Bitcoin's design on um, a much more performant and, you know, in our minds, possibly secure uh, consensus engine that doesn't require all the, the proof of work that Bitcoin requires. I mean, some people want the proof of work for their own crazy reasons. But basically what we have now with Tendermint is something that is uh, sufficiently modular in general that you could implement any blockchain design on top of it, as, at least as far as the application state goes. Obviously, we're using the Tendermint consensus algorithm and we're opinionated about that. Um, because we think it's the best Byzantine fault tolerant algorithm out there to date, and you know, hopefully, we'll be able to prove that to you over the coming months. So, um, so for our listeners, perhaps, um, perhaps I can offer a sort of analogy or way of thinking about about uh, about our, our our conversation to come. So, in any blockchain, we could think of three important components that must work together to to do something useful. The first component is like a networking layer or, or a gossip layer, which is once I once I create a transaction and send it to one node, how do the nodes communicate that transaction to the other ones? That sort of component is the first important component that's needed in a, in a blockchain. Bitcoin has it, Ethereum has it, Tendermint will have it. The second component is um, once the message is like, once my transaction is propagated to the whole network, how do all of the nodes come to agreement on uh, which transactions to accept in the ledger or the block. Like this is kind of the consensus algorithm. How do, how, how do all of the nodes come to agreement on some pieces of data? The pieces of data may be transactions, they might be something else altogether. So Bitcoin has the proof of work consensus. And the third important component then is um, what kinds of things can you do with the data that is that is in the blockchain, which is kind of the application state. So for, in, for instance, in, in Bitcoin, once you have data about some transactions, you could, you could, uh, you could um, run some simple scripts based on the Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin language, which is based on fourth. And in Ethereum, you could uh, write very complicated smart contracts on the data that is already there in the blockchain. So th there is three components like networking, consensus, and uh, application state. Now, what, ten what Tendermint, in my opinion, has done is it has innovated both on how consensus works and how application state could work in a blockchain, right? Would that be a good characterization? Yes, um, we, uh, we've we solved the consensus. That's certainly an innovation. Um, and there, we'll talk about application state and uh, how we use uh, Linux containers to solve that problem. But um, networking too, it's, it's a problem that we solve. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's much of an innovation, except we have a very good solution for networking as well. So um, if you look at the code base today, uh, we've modularized it so much that um, the, we, we've created a separate library just to handle peer-to-peer. Um, -peer. Uh, we've created a peer-to-peer -peer library that can um, handle much of the, uh, the details of um, uh, fair communication among peers. And uh, what we do is we um, uh, uh, divide a communication channel into multiple uh, sub-channels of communication, and we handle multiplexing. I mean, those are all things that you need to do if you want to create a secure system. And so we've done all that as well. Um, so that's networking. But uh, yes, we solved that. We solved that so the application developer doesn't need to solve it, doesn't need to worry about it. Consensus. Um, we uh, Tendermint was the first. Uh, we were the first to... Um, uh, publish a white paper that describes how to use classical Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms uh, to uh, to secure a blockchain. Um, and that happened in March 2014. This is before like Hyperledger was even a company. 
Um, and uh, ever since then, we've been iterating and improving it. And uh, now it's just to the point where it's pretty optimal and there's not a whole lot more that you can improve upon it. Um, there are some, we have a roadmap of things to do, um, but in, practically we've solved it for 99% of the use cases. Um, and we found a way to abstract that as well. So, um, so we've created this thing called Tender, uh, TMSP. Uh, it's short for Tender Mint Socket Protocol. And uh, it allows uh, you, uh, as a blockchain application developer, to, to uh, focus on the business logic, uh, only on the business logic, not on the consensus or the networking. And you can write your program in any language. And the way we do this is, um, is uh, it's very different than, say, the way an Ethereum uh, Solidity contract, smart contract, works. Right? So in Ethereum, uh, what you have is a, a virtual machine um, that uh, runs on the blockchain. Um, the, the Ethereum is a, is a monolithic um, stack that has a Turing complete virtual machine and uh, the virtual machine uh, handles uh, uh, opcode counting so it, it can handle um, the, the fairness of, uh, of resource usage like CPU, memory, and storage. Um, but another way to do that is to just isolate an entire process, a whole process uh, by process, I mean like a Linux process, um, a process that handles um, the, the processing of logic of transactions or the business logic uh, and, and contain it um, using Linux container technology. And so Linux container technology isn't new. It's been around for a long time, but it's now getting to the point where we can um, um, cre uh, isolate a process completely uh, so that you can run any process on it. Um, we don't need to do Ethereum style like opcode counting because uh, the uh, Linux container technology can just uh, make sure that each container, uh, each process gets a fair amount of resource usage and we can limit the amount of memory used in each one. So, uh, so application state wise, um, you know, it's, we, don't, we don't solve that. We create a platform where you can create any application state logic. Let's take a quick break so I can take you to Paris. There, I met with Eric Larchevêque, Ledger CEO, and he filled me in on some of the new products they've recently released. On our website, ledgerwallet.com, you will find all our range of products. The new NFC-based hardware wallet, the Unplugged, and of course, the Ledger Nano that you all know, which also exists, by the way, on a cool bracelet wearable, so you can have it with you all the time. There is the Ledger HW1 for enterprise use, multi-signature, and a range of accessories, the Ledger Starter, which helps you to securely initialize a Nano or HW1, and the Ledger OTG on the go, with which you can connect your Nano or HW1 directly on Android phone to use it in mobility. So go to LedgerWallet.com and check out Ledger's full range of hardware security options, with more to come soon. We have a special offer for our listeners. When you use the code EPICENTER, you'll get 10% off your order. We'd like to thank Ledger for their support of EPICENTER Bitcoin. Let's, let's, let's get into this theme and get a deep understanding of um, how Tendermint differs from Ethereum. Now, um, like in, in Tendermint, uh, kind of one of the, in, in your blogs, you write that... Uh, with Tendermint, developers could deploy smart contracts in any, could write smart contracts in any language they could, they, they want to like C, C++. Whereas in Ethereum, um, they have languages such as Solidity and LLL and smart contracts must be written in only those languages because only those languages can then be transformed into or compiled down to the Ethereum virtual machine bytecode. Now, so the questions become, um, why would first for the first question is why would a developer want to write smart contracts in C or C plus plus? What's the advantage for it? And and the second question, which is perhaps less important at this point, is how do you do it? So uh, the advantage is familiarity and the tool set. Solidity is a brand new language. It's a it's a very nice language. It has its quirks, and a lot of those quirks are related to the underlying virtual machine, which is the design Ethereum went with. Um, which, you know, certain people have trouble with. We've, we've struggled with it at, at Eris trying to do certain things. We've made our own necessary changes. And a lot of times when, you know, I'm teaching someone about how to use blockchains and the state of the art is deploying contracts on Ethereum, they get kind of frustrated that they have to 
use this new language, right? And some of them, depending on who they are, I mean, some of them love the fact that all they have to do is write a few lines of solidity. Others want uh, a much, much more low-level control. Maybe they want to do particular optimizations. Maybe they know the hardware the machine's going to run on and so on. And Ethereum doesn't really allow that at a level under the application developer's control, right? They'd have to, they'd have to dive into the particular blockchain implementation and tease that all apart. So what this enables, what TMSP enables, is you to write the application, still just the business logic, um, in whatever language you want, and write your own you know, testing suites, your own debugging tools, or you can use ones that have been around for 20 years that were used to build Linux, you know, things like this. You could have the most powerful software today working for you while you build your app. Um, and then once you're ready, then you can link it up to the blockchain um, over a TMSP connection very simply just by implementing a simple interface which allows the blockchain to pass, connect pass transactions to your app and allows your app to return hashes back to the blockchain. And with this, this very simple back and forth like this, you can have arbitrary applications written in whatever language you want um, and, and go from there. And so since it's a generalized platform for arbitrary applications, you can of course write an application that is the Ethereum virtual machine. So you could run the Ethereum virtual machine over TMSP, and if that's how you want to spend your time, then you can continue writing Solidity contracts, deploying them just as you would, only now it's running over, over TMSP and on the Tendermint core instead of on um, Ethereum. And ultimately, you know, that's the kind of thing that, that Eris will be doing sort of in the short term is uh, taking what was currently all in process, like ErisDB, Eris's blockchain is all in process with, with Tendermint, right? And so it sort of confines you to using the particulars of the Eris stack. But maybe an application that wants some of the features doesn't want all the features or they want to have a fork, but they don't want to deal with all the complexity of maintaining a fork, right? So by splitting it up into containers and having those containers talk TMSP, you get a lot more modularity and a lot more control over what you want to do and what you want to use and how you do your development and so on. And so it, it's all about giving flexibility to the developers and sort of uh, taking a step back. I mean, blockchains, when, when Bitcoin was introduced, even though all the pieces were there before, the way of putting it together was so out of the blue and so unprecedented and so like anything else that that people really took it as like this, this really unique brand new thing. And, what's ha and you know, Ethereum sort of built on top of that and added this, this generalizability layer. But now what we're doing is going back to the lower level components and sort of breaking, breaking them apart to see how, you know, a lot of what's here is really very similar to what organizations like Amazon and Google have been using to maintain very highly available uh, networked systems. The differences are, you know, we want Byzantine tolerance because we don't necessarily trust everyone or we want, you know, greater tolerance to software errors. We want Merkle trees because we want to be able to provide simple proofs. We want to use elliptic key signatures because that's the state of the art in cryptography. And we want to use a peer-to-peer -peer network. And you take those, those four things together, that's really what blockchains are. And sort of teasing it apart gives you a, a, a better idea of sort of how they relate to systems that have been around forever, how they in innovate and improve on them, and how they'll fit into existing infrastructure. And so we feel that the, the Tendermint application platform and the TMSP really get at the heart uh, of those questions and sort of make it easier to understand blockchains. I mean, it, w one thing you touched on there is, is something we've talked about on the show before is you know how the Bitcoin client came out as this one piece of software. And I think you mentioned this, I don't know if this is a term that's widely used, but spaghetti code is like, you know, all the code is all uh is all munched together and you don't have clear separation between the different components which you know like you mentioned is this is the way you write software this is the way infrastructure is written you have like different components that talk to each other and the code is clearly separated and um you know companies like google amazon and all enterprise companies write code like this so uh, it'd be interesting to think you know if, if if bitcoin had been written like that to begin with if we'd have something completely different today what that would look like um but I want to come back to the to uh, to uh, the TP uh, sorry TMSP. Um, how so? I'm trying to get a better idea of what this really looks like. So you you have the consensus um, mechanism running on different nodes, and then you have your application talking to the consensus mechanism through this socket protocol. Uh, does your application say it's written in C++ with your business logic, with your smart contracts, et cetera, uh, talking to, to the consensus protocol uh, through the socket, 
is that logic on every one of the nodes or is that sort of, is that running on a centralized server? Can you walk us through a bit more like how this actually look, what this actually looks like? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll take this one. Um, it's, it's the first option that you, you mentioned. So uh, at Tendermint Core, the blockchain consensus engine speaks to the application uh, via TMSP, but this network uh, socket connection is not exposed to the internet. Um, those two processes that are connected by TMSP uh, runs uh, in, a, in a secure container, uh, well, two separate containers, but they, are, uh, they only speak to each other uh, except the core, which is also exposed to the greater internet. So those two pieces uh, uh, run on each machine. Um, and uh, the app only speaks to the core, their respective cores, while the cores, the tenement cores, uh, speak to each other as well as the app. Um, and uh, when there's a transaction uh, or when there's a block being committed, uh, each, each core will, uh, will speak to its uh, application, which is kind of like a black box. Um, that only it, that it, that it owns, um, and uh, it, it'll it'll run the transactions and, and get a hash back. Uh, but otherwise, the application uh, is meant to be isolated from the rest of the world. Okay, so the the smart contract logic then exists on every one of the machines that is a node. Uh, simply, the smart contract logic is in one container. The consensus layer is in another container, and they talk to each other uh, through the uh, the socket protocol. Yes, one of the big advantages uh, is. We believe there's going to be a, a whole new sort of um, epoch of uh, multi-blockchain uh, design. And so um, with this container architecture, um, it's very easy to allow these blockchains to speak to one another. And so new applications right now, we're going to see like single one-off applications be built. But uh, pretty soon, uh, there's going to be this multi-blockchain application design, which is going to really, really shake things up. Okay, so coming back to virtual machines then, and and the Ethereum virtual machine, particularly because it is the one that that uh, Tendermint uses. You mentioned in one of your blog posts that the Ethereum VM is one of the uh, the potentially many supported virtual machines. Um, if so, I guess two questions. So the first is, if you can write your business logic in your own uh, you know, preferred language, having access to libraries you already are used to, testing libraries, etc. Uh, if you have that, then why on earth would you want to run a virtual machine? And secondly, um, if this isn't the only one, which others, which other virtual machines could we potentially see uh, being compatible with Tendermint? And are there advantages, or would some of be better for certain things, or whatnot? Sure. Um, there's two advantages to uh, having a blockchain with its own virtual uh, machine, and these are very good reasons for Ethereum to exist. Um, uh, one is that you might want to allow arbitrary uh, logic to be uploaded by users to the blockchain. Um, maybe you don't trust um, their code. Um, you don't know how long their code is going to run. You certainly don't want that uh, smart contract to, to uh, loop forever and waste resources, for example. Um, and so by having a virtual machine, you can have a, a simple environment where uh, anybody can upload their smart contracts. Of course, you can also do this with Docker. It's just that um, you can do this with Linux containers, but it's not as lightweight with Linux containers. Um, it's it's If you're gonna have a lot, many, many um, of these smart contracts, especially things that are one-offs, then you'll want uh, something like the EVM. Uh, the other reason is because uh, uh, Solidity, uh, well, the EVM is a deterministic virtual machine. So when you program in C, C++, Java, you know, Golang, uh, not everything is necessarily deterministic. For example, when you uh, iterate over uh, a key value map in Golang, um, by default, um, the language will, will randomize the order of the keys for you. But the, the central tenet of blockchains is that everything needs to be deterministic because that determinism is what allows all the nodes to know that everybody's in the same state. Right? So when you're writing an application uh, on Tendermint using TMSP, you have to be cognizant of that. Um, of course, we'll be developing tools to make this easier for you, um, but uh, it's something that people can already do because, and we know this because uh, that's what blockchain developers are already doing. 
Um, we know that game developers do this uh, to create lockstep multiplayer games. Um, so it's not impossible, it just requires uh, thinking. And so it's a, it's a different kind of trade-off between having to uh, learn Solidity and programming that and be uh, semi-locked into that kind of environment versus having to um, uh, program in a slightly different paradigm but using the same tools that you're familiar with. And, and there, there's a few additional things. Um... One of which is is compatibility with Ethereum. Maybe that's a goal of your blockchain design for you know a, a whole host of reasons. You want to hook into a public economic chain, but you want to be able to do things on the side with your own permission sets. Other reasons are that Ethereum with Solidity is, is uh, it comes with a bunch of features that are still being fleshed out. Some of them are, are pretty solid. Things like um, encoding formats for arguments. Things like how uh, how the state is managed and stored so that you don't have to think at all about how you're going to prove to someone the state of, of one of your contracts. Ethereum sort of deals with that for you under the hood. Whereas if you're implementing from scratch in, in TMSP, you know, the advantage is, yes, you have the flexibility and you have the control, but the disadvantage is, well, with great, con you know, with great responsibility comes, or sorry, with great power comes great responsibility, right? To accidentally misquote Spider-Man. Um, so, uh, we can provide the tools to make it easier for people, but some people, you know, depending on what they want, it makes sense to have something where it's all just prepackaged, like the Ethereum virtual machine is, and uh, it works right out of the box uh, with Solidity. Other things Solidity is doing is trying to implement formal verification through comments. So they're building out a system so that you can comment your code in a way that can be verified by the compiler so that it's like more like English and can guarantee invariance of the code. So for example, you can, you can guarantee that someone balance, someone's balance is never going to be negative or something like this, right? Um, and having to have the expertise to implement that yourself in your own language can be you know, more than most developers are willing to bargain for. And there are only so many languages um, that actually do that already. So again, Ethereum, the EVM provides this sort of all-in-one package and if you want to escape that, you have the flexibility now with TMSP. And if you don't, you could even use Ethereum, Ethereum's mechanisms and data structures on top of TMSP as well, alongside possibly other things you're doing on TMSP. So it really just gives you the ultimate flexibility to use whatever pieces you want from anyone. Yeah, this is one of our one of our goals has um, shifted in the early days. Jay was very focused on consensus and, and building um, a better, faster. Uh, cheaper Bitcoin, uh, but as of the last six months or so, we've become very focused on building tools for blockchain developers. And so, what you see is that we are extracting away all of the complexity, um, as well as giving as much freedom and uh, choice uh, to the developers. So, just you know, what we're really trying to do is lower the bar for blockchain development. Um, when you're talking about um, you know all of this low-level plumbing uh, that's involved with doing something like forking uh, Ethereum. There's probably like a hundred people on the planet that know how to do this, uh, this kind of work. And there's no reason, yeah, Ethan and Jay <laughs> happen to be two of them. Uh, but uh, um, there's no there's no reason that every single application developer needs to do this in the same way that if you're like um, an iOS application developer, or you're building an iPhone app. There's no reason that you would need to recreate the um, operating system. Um, and so where we reside in the st stack is very low. Um, and uh, what we try to do is just make that as accessible to application developers as possible and to uh, make it as powerful as possible as well. You mentioned something that I just want, just want to make clear I understand this. So you mentioned that Ethereum could be a means to communicate with some public block, with the, with the outside world, with some public blockchain like Ethereum or, or Bitcoin perhaps? So oh, I, I, I just meant that by using Ethereum's data structures, you're using Ethereum's data structures so that any tools Ethereum build will be more will be applicable to you. And then once we're in a world where blockchains are talking to each other, it'll be easier for your blockchain to sort of talk to and understand Ethereum and vice versa because all the data structures are the same. Okay, right. But so but you could also, I mean, if you wanted your application to also talk to, say, the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, you could use a... Bitcoin library within your application that you write in your language and then talks to the consensus Absolutely. mechanism with this. Absolutely. Okay. And you can do that, you know, in your own language and Ethereum has even done it in Serpent. They've built uh, like a, a Bitcoin node 
it's not a full node. It doesn't process the whole chain. It's basically a light client. But they built it in Serpent and it runs in the Ethereum virtual machine. I'm not sure how much gas it costs to, to run anything there, but uh, they've done it. So it's a very powerful, uh, it's a very powerful engine and, and development environment, but it does have its quirks. And, you know, there's, there are reasons to use it and reasons not, depending on your circumstance. So, so um, okay, let's, let's go into an example to, to just kind of flesh out this, uh, this discussion. So, like in Switzerland, the, the two big banks that people use are like Credit Suisse and UBS. And let's, let's imagine a scenario where Credit Suisse and UBS together want to build a blockchain. And for for like for for ease of assumption, let's also think they don't want to maintain the infrastructure. Uh, so we have two scenarios, in, and two banks are in both scenarios, and they want to build a blockchain in both. In scenario one, what they want is um, any customer of UBS should be able to write any smart contract and deploy it to to the joint blockchain, and the blockchain will run it. So. For instance, if there was a way by which uh, somebody could could write, uh, I don't know, a smart contract that allowed me to track the value of an Apple share by holding Swiss francs, anyone can write it on that blockchain. That's scenario one. Anyone can push any code they want to this bank blockchain. And scenario two is the opposite, the other one where uh, the banks want to restrict the functionality of the blockchain to only a few elements. Like the elements might be Okay, the customer can uh, can send money to another customer on the blockchain. The customer can exchange the UBS Swiss franc for a Credit Suisse Swiss, Swiss franc. The customer can deposit the Swiss franc to get interest. And let, let's say there are only five or six defined functions. So in one case, you have you want to build a blockchain where you want that to be very open, like a like a Swiss Army knife can can do anything. And in the second case, you want the blockchain to only do a specific set of things. Now, what you're essentially saying is, um, if you want like the Swiss Army knife kind of scenario, go for the Ethereum virtual machine architecture. And if you want to go for the restricted function scenario, and the developers of the blockchain want to optimize the performance of the blockchain for those scenarios, then they should go for smart contracts in some other language. Is Would that be a good way to look at it? That's uh, that's sort of it. So uh, I want to clarify that um, the the platform that we're building out um, is not uh, restricted in the sense that uh, if you build on our platform, then uh, the business logic that you can write is is necessarily uh, limited. Okay. So what I mean is, uh, you can actually launch multiple parallel blockchains um, and have uh, isolated uh, functions that are each their own blockchain. So if that fits within your model, uh, you know, let's say you're a bank, you might have, um, you know, you have like Forex, you have uh, uh, syndicated loans, um, all these capital markets uh, functions, you might need 100 blockchains to manage all of that. But you probably want to have each blockchain be, uh, uh, you know, the, the code be very specialized in each regard, um, rather than having uh, one general blockchain that anybody can upload arbitrary code to, because that's, you know, from a bank's perspective, impossible to audit, right? There's no way you can audit arbitrary code. You'd have to limit the functionality anyways. Um, so it's it's not like a Swiss Army knife versus restricted. It's more like uh, a Swiss Army knife versus uh, a more, it's a different kind of Swiss Army knife. It's one, it's, okay, uh, so where Ethereum- like a Swiss like, Army knife versus a toolbox. Versus a toolbox. Right. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, our, our platform is still turned complete because we're using Linux containers. It's just not exactly. the same kind, right? Yeah. Um, so here's a, a case where, in terms of performance, like Ethereum might make sense. If you have many one-off smart contracts where users can have, you know, each user might have their own specific kind, uh, completely different one-off smart contract then it doesn't make sense to use uh, put all of those in, in, in Docker containers today because uh, each one of those will be their own process and you don't want to be running like uh, a billion processes, right? Um, so if, for that case, you, you might want Ethereum. But for most use cases, that's not going to be the case. So uh, you might want to use TMSP. Um, you can also have a blockchain 
that uh, is for the most part uh, restricted, like you said, like uh, it's a blockchain that does very specialized things, but occasionally invokes the EVM, Ethereum virtual machine, uh, in cases where uh, you need to invoke arbitrary contracts. You might get something like that when um, you have something like a, a payment channel system where to close out the payment channel, you can, you know, you have a variety of options for uh, dealing with uh, conflicts. Uh, you might want to ask uh, an oracle or, or and do something, or you might want to uh, run an arbitrary contract. And, uh, you know, it, it might be that most of the time you don't have to call these EVM functions. So you don't want to build your application to rely entirely in the EVM, but only invoke it when necessary. So uh, it's, so it's very complicated. Yeah. You know, the from a from a high level, censorship resistance is very expensive. We saw that with Bitcoin, and you know that's sort of uh, people have become to realize as they've been moving more and more towards blockchains. And uh, but um, that's true of Ethereum as well. And so when you have a virtual machine that anyone can upload code to, the the underlying infrastructure required to support that um, inherently, I think, inherently means that. Um, you can build systems like if that's not an assumption, which isn't for most permissioned use cases that you need censorship resistance. Um, illogically, it makes sense that um, you could build a system that is more efficient, and that's what Tendermint's trying to do. Uh, there's a quote I it, it, I read it, it was one of Tim Swanson's. I'm not sure it was him or Robert Sams or somebody, but it was essentially that uh, censorship resistant use cases will gravitate towards censorship resistant systems, and non censorship resistant use cases will gravitate towards non censorship resistant systems. And um, so I think that's a that's a big part of the market that. Uh, we're going to act, going after and trying to cater towards. So you know, yes, we 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 are restricted in the fact that yes, you you can't just upload any arbitrary code, uh, but in in other ways that really opens us up to being able to be much more flexible. Okay, so um, yeah, that 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 cl clarifies the situation. Um, in my mind, in my mind, I I see it like um, with if you have something like ethereum like like an evm and uh, a couple of banks uh, build a blockchain like ethereum the problem might be that somebody let's say uploads a ponzi scheme contract onto their blockchain and then their blockchain executes that and that gives them a hard time with the regulators so they might they might not want to open up the general functionality and this the thing is if you want to open up such general functionality, it costs a lot in terms of resources. Like you need a specialized EVM that needs to count cycles. That needs there's, there's a lot of administrative overhead for for actually be building such a general blockchain. So for a bank that wants a blockchain in which it can do few things and keep adding on those things as they want to, but not necessarily allowing the people to uh, put smart contracts of their choosing into it, they can use. Uh, like your architecture to do that. And your architecture will be more efficient because it can be designed like purpose built for exactly their application, their set of applications, right? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and it's, not, it's not even that the, uh, the blockchain is immutable. If you want, um, just like you can choose to run the Ethereum virtual machine and make it permissionless and censorship resistant, um, you can also uh, upload a new kind of application. You can have nested Docker containers. So you can have an application um, on running on TMSP uh, where if you want to extend it, you, you submit a transaction that has uh, a code that gets compiled and, 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 and spawns a new sub Docker container. Um, and you can manage, uh, uh, well, sub applications. Maybe, they're, maybe at that point, they should be called smart contracts. Um, there's a lot of ways to do it. You can have um, different configurations like that uh, to handle uh, upgradability, uh, mutability of the blockchain function. Exactly. So at the end of the day, TMSP basically gives you the best of both worlds because you can take any conceivable blockchain application state and build it on top and put multiple ones together like Jay was just saying. If you want some purpose-built contracts, but you also want the EVM and you also want your EVM to be upgradable and your purpose-built contracts to be upgradable and possibly to have multiple versions running at once and so on, we could build a TMSP app and, and probably will that is basically a Docker orchestration app so that people can send transactions that bring up new Docker containers uh, and use that to manage you know, the contracts. And then if they want to do specific contracts on the EVM, then they can do that and we don't have to launch new containers. But if they want you know, to write a contract in Haskell or whatever language of choice, um, then we can support that too. 
So at the end of the day, it's a, it's it, the the flexibility is enormous here, and it's really up to the particular use cases of what they want. Yeah, that's that seems very clear and awesome. I um, mean, that's that's certainly I think the most unique approach I've I've, I've seen in this space until now. And it it wasn't so clear from the blog, but now from from this conversation, it really is. So I mean, um, we should move on to the the second interesting topic of. Uh, of 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 our podcast, and uh, because Jay has worked so much on consensus, um, and he he wanted to initially build a better consensus uh, system for uh, for cryptocurrencies. Uh, perhaps we should go into what what is special about Tendermint consensus and how it works. So Jay, could you give an could you give an, a short intro of how consensus in Tendermint works? Uh, sure. I'll try. I just want to mention it's not it's not just me. Uh, Ethan has done tremendous work in uh, in uh, verifying the algorithm and also refactoring it, um, and re-implementing it to be uh, much more modular, understandable, and deterministic. Um, but uh, I can give a start, and maybe Ethan can jump in too. So, so in your consensus algorithm, you have uh, it's a round based algorithm, right? Where you have like lots yes. of validator nodes. And uh, they, yes. they communicate with each other to build blocks. So, how does it work, and how is it different from Bitcoin? Okay, sure. Um, a high-level overview. Um, it we don't use electricity, like we mentioned. Um, it's not about uh, how much cost went into producing this blockchain. Um, that's not how people come to agreement. Rather, uh, there's a set number of uh, voters who uh, uh, should. Uh, in an ideal scenario, all be online, um, dedicated to committing blocks together. And uh, a high level is that, um, you know, let's say there's a hundred of these validator, uh, they all have a public private key pair, and uh, you need a quorum, a, a set, at least two thirds of them to sign a block uh, for it to be committed. Um, so it's a round based uh, protocol. And uh, what we mean is that um, every round, uh, uh, so let's say we have a blockchain um, and we need to uh, decide on the next block. Um, there's going to be a, a designated proposer uh, based on the, uh, the past history on the blockchain. Uh, there is a, uh, a proposer who is decided, uh, unanimously decided, to be the next proposer for the next round. And we start at round uh, zero or round one. Um, so the first, first round, uh, there's a proposer who proposes a block. That block gets gossiped to everyone, and then there are uh, two more uh, phases. So the first phase was proposal. The second phase is uh, pre-vote. Uh, that's what we call it. It's a, it's a vote signing phase. And the third phase is another vote signing phase that we call pre-commit. So uh, uh, by the way, block is just a list of transactions. Um, and uh, all right, so let's get into it. Um, after the block is proposed, um, the next step is pre-vote, uh, where all the validators check to see if the transactions are valid. Um, they run the transactions um, and see if the, if the block is good to them. And then uh, the, if two-thirds or more of, uh, of pre-votes uh, are seen by a validator, in the third step, uh, in the pre-commit step, they, uh, if they see two-thirds or more pre-votes, they go ahead and pre-commit it. Uh, they sign a, a, a vote that says, uh, this is a pre-commit vote, and yes, I saw two thirds or more of pre-votes for this block, and uh, and uh, and they sign it. And if two thirds uh, pre-commit it, um, then the block is committed. So ideally, uh, the whole process happens uh, in one round. Um, most of the time, that's what will happen. But when there's latency in the network, um, or when the proposer is offline, or when the proposer proposes an invalid block then uh, it's possible to uh, have to go on to the next round where um, the next um, designated proposer is chosen. Uh, it's predetermined, actually. It's not chosen, um, but rather uh, the next proposer in line proposes a block and we do this thing again. Um, there's more detail involved with, uh, with locking and timeouts that uh, it's very difficult to get into uh, in a podcast. Um, uh, if you want to learn more, then I suggest uh, uh, going to the GitHub wiki um, for Tendermint, where we have a specification of uh, the consensus algorithm. Um, so uh, there. Today's magic word is socket, S-O-C-K-E-T. 
head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener reward. So with Bitcoin, we have proof of work where essentially you put up uh, electricity and computing power in order to... Um, to, to mine a block and based on the amount of computing power you have, you have a probability, uh, your, your, your odds of winning uh, the, the block will, will be proportionate to your amount of electricity. Uh, I don't think I need to get into uh, to your amount of computing power. I don't think I need to get into uh, how proof of work works, uh, but with proof of stake, it's, it's different. So you have something to lose and that is that you're putting up a deposit. Um, can you explain how how that's fundamentally different from Bitcoin uh, in um, in Tendermint or perhaps even other uh, proof of stake systems. How how is Tendermint different from those? Well, from from a high level, remember that we don't have this assumption that you need censorship resistance, and um, that's why you have all this complexity around um, proof of work or you know, Nakamoto consensus. It's actually a pretty pretty clever solution uh, under the assumption that. You know, anyone can submit a transaction. Anybody can validate a transaction. Um, one of the one of the problems, uh, kind of derailing just for a quick second, uh, is uh, that the financial institutions face is this thing called OFAC, Office of Foreign Asset Control. Um, it's actually a subset of the Department of Defense. And so, and what that what OFAC does is it says, hey, certain countries, um, certain companies, certain people, you can't deal with. And, um, and if you do, uh, you've got the Department of Defense to answer to. And so a lot of financial institutions we talk to are worried, hey, if I use Bitcoin, what happens if uh, someone processes a transaction in North Korea? Do I just violate OFAC? Um, and so um, you know, censorship resistance is not only um, uh, is an actual problem for many of the financial institutions who very much like to know who their counterparties are. Um, and so... If we're operating in this world where uh, we want to know who our counterparties are, um, what, it's pretty simple that like um, you can just leverage the existing uh, legal system. Um, and so just the way that like um, financial institutions or uh, enterprise clients will hire um, software manufacturers to perform certain duties with them and they have legal contracts. Um, and if you break those contracts, then there can be ramifications. Um, so now we also have baked in this monetary guarantee uh, that is a little bit uh, more fundamental to our system that doesn't require, uh, it can, but doesn't necessarily have to require um, the outside uh, legal system. So uh, and es essentially what happens is if you don't act appropriately, then you get punished. Uh, to, to be a validator in the system, you need to put, you, you can require um, validators to put up a bond. Uh, and uh, if you don't uh, validate properly, then you lose that bond. And so we kind of envision this world where um, validation will be very specific to different regions and different circumstances. And we think it could be quite likely that, you know, regulation could even be passed that requires validators to put up bonds in the same way money transmitters have to put up surety bonds. Um, but a lot of this is sort of unclear right now where the, the, where the world will, will evolve to. Um, we're pretty flexible in regards to, you know, how we kind of fit into that future landscape. So um, I just want to add, that's a uh, very good point. Um, Bitcoin, you know, is censorship resistant because uh, it's anonymous, but uh, it, it comes with, uh, you know, characteristics like it's slow to commit blocks because you have to burn a lot of electricity over time in order to have any kind of guarantee that there was cost associated with it. Um, okay, but when you have validators who are public and, uh, or pseudonymous even, but if you know who your validators are um, and... Uh, if in order to attack the blockchain, uh, you require a significant proportion to collude, and when that happens, you can figure out who did it, so it's accountable. Uh, those three combinations, the uh, knowing who the validators are, even pseudonymity, um, uh, requiring a significant uh, fraction to attack the network, which is provided by the BFT algorithm, uh, along with uh, being able to know who uh, caused the attack, um, those three properties together is what makes proof of stake secure. Uh, so that's um, the way it's different. Um, and uh, I would say that high level overview of the security characteristics, like uh, 
Bitcoin requires continuous burn of electricity to uh, to ensure um, security, whereas in proof of stake, uh, in the kind of model that we just talked about, um, it don't require a constant burn. You can you can come to complete agreement, a final commit of a block in as little as under a second. You know, it's really just about two rounds of communications among the validators, and you can have final commits without having to wait. Right? And that's because uh, the the security doesn't come from burning, but it comes from uh, collateral. So the, in essence, uh, to come back on what um, uh, Dustin was saying, you, you could have a Tendermint blockchain where there is no there is no collateral to put forth. Simply all of the nodes are taking turns validating blocks. Um, is that right? Like you, you could con you could have a system like that. Okay. So then on the sort of spectrum of fully permissioned blockchains where all the actors know each other, let's say, for example, different uh, branches of the same bank, and then moving towards um, less less trust between actors, so perhaps like two different banks working together, and then the fully uh, untrusted... Uh, permissionless. Because permissionless, which is like Bitcoin, basically. Um, where does Tendermint best suit like what for what use cases is, is tenement best suited and and what where on that spectrum does this proof of stake algorithm um ex excel yes um i would say that uh it's the first two that you mentioned that we're specializing for today so uh for uh, banks that are identified and trusted um, they can have collateral that is held uh, off the chain. Um, it could be maybe even just reputation based, perhaps if you're talking about the Federal Reserve or something. Or consortia, uh, consortiums where uh, 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 members post collateral on the blockchain or possibly on another blockchain, or, or they, it might be off the blockchain with legal contracts with uh, distributed or centralized depositories, right? Uh, that's what we're building for today because that's what business wants and that's uh, those are the, uh, the business cases that exist today that said uh, we can also uh, tenement the, the consensus algorithm can also work for the latter case that you mentioned that's more permissionless um, it's just that uh, we're not building our own public blockchain today yeah the pain point is definitely like, currently is in areas that um, where there's high stakes, so financial institutions, and, and where there's uh, limited trust also happens to be quite frequently financial institutions, uh, particularly those looking to create consortiums. Uh, so, you know, obviously the, the idea there is just cutting out the middleman so all these banks can, can work and interop and uh, work together directly. Um, but uh, it's quite interesting. We, we thought a lot about the, the reasons behind uh, permission blockchains. And we knew quite early that there, were, there was an opportunity to support permission blockchain developers. However, we really dug into the, like the why. The, okay, yeah, you, you want to build a permission blockchain app and we can help you, but why do you want to build one? And that was a, that was a deep, deep rabbit hole that, uh, that and, and on, one of the things that came out of it was that, you know, even, um, even a single organization can benefit from uh, a permission blockchain, um, particularly large organizations uh, where you have uh, regions or departments that don't fully trust each other um, and with their data. And remember, in this new world, data uh, data is, equals assets. So you know, for to kind of you know, Bitcoin this is this digital bearer asset like cash. Um, you know, you hold the Bitcoin, the private keys. You don't own the money. Similar to I hold, hold the twenty dollar bill. I have access to that money. It's not an IOU. Um, and so, right now, what we'll I think we'll see movement towards is more and more um, digital bearer assets. Uh, Chain's doing some great work in this department. Um, and um, and then once we have this world where uh, you know data equals assets, then trust uh, becomes infinitely more important, um, or actually the lack of trust even within these organizations uh, because they don't want to won't necessarily want to trust. Uh, their assets to other departments or other regions, and so um, you know that's how I think it'll kind of evolve into the the non financial space, and and really, it's blockchains are essentially uh, very high performing databases. Uh, they're not, and so there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, use cases that are going to uh, come out of it. So um, I think the business models and the use cases are the are a topic we want to handle next. But just before we jump to that theme. Uh, 
unless I'd, I'd like Ethan or Jay to chime in and give an example of how fast and how scalable these blockchains are. Like what are the performance characteristics? Can we illustrate to an example? So in, in Tendermint, we, we've been benchmarking um, pieces of the stack recently. Uh, and the, the main figure we're throwing around is that we can crunch 10,000 empty, like non-processed transactions per second. So um, you're not doing anything fancy. There's virtually no logic. You're just moving around transactions that are, I don't know, maybe 100 bytes. I forget what we actually used. Um, and we can get around 10,000 per second. And this is before we do um, any optimizations, including some very low-hanging ones that, that we already know about. Um, so we expect that with those optimizations, we could get that number up to you know, 30, 40, maybe 50,000, maybe even higher. Um, and then and go from there. So ba the the sort of benchmark for or like the lowest level for hitting you know practical Byzantine fault tolerant systems, I think people usually put at around at least a few thousand transac transactions per second, maybe ten thousand, uh, and we're we're hitting that easily. So the in terms of uh, throughput of transactions, uh, the 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 bottleneck will probably be on the application side. So depending on the, you know, you, we can't just answer that question because uh, it really depends on the application, what the logic is, how many users there are. Uh, for example, if you have um, uh, a, a Merkleized, you know, binary uh, search tree, it's not self-balancing or a Patricia tree, um, and you have uh, a billion accounts uh, or a million accounts or a billion accounts, then there's going to be overhead, especially when that tree is uh, accessing disk for every uh, for every uh, you know update or read right but um, on the other hand you can actually stick all of that in memory if you have a terabyte of ram and your application logic your business logic is very simple uh, and it's just for example a very simple cryptocurrency for a billion accounts you can stick a lot of it in ram and um, and optimize the logic so that it doesn't use uh, an advanced merkle tree but still with merkleization um, and you can you know get up to like uh, 50,000 transactions per second on commodity machine uh, it really depends on how you code the application and what the use cases are and how many how much data there is in it and what your persistence model is so moving on to uh use cases and this is something that i mean i i constantly think of and you know we we, we all i guess constantly think of is like where is this going where where what are going to be the prime use cases for blockchain technologies whether it's in a permission system or permissionless or somewhere in between um, you know, obviously we talk about the financial sector a lot. Obviously we talk about, um, coding business logic into, into a decentralized system. We talk about fidelity points. We talk about IOT, but all these examples are have yet to be demonstrated. We're still just sort of thinking about how we could do it. And there's a couple of proof of concepts, but you know, nothing like on a massive scale where like we can just clearly show this works and we've saved so much money or uh, we saved so much time. Um, I'd like to ask you, perhaps all three of you, uh, what you think are the most obvious use cases for blockchain technologies and which ones will get implemented and we'll see like, okay, this is a, a clear uh, pain point that blockchains can fix. There's for the first production use cases we're going to see are ones that sit on top of legacy systems. So there's, um, there's a company that we're working with, uh, we call them uh, Block Street companies, like Blockchain, Wall Street. And so um, it's a Block, Block Street startup that um, um, what they do is uh, in the- I the, still prefer Wall Chain, by the way. <laughs> yeah, Ethan likes Wall Chain. Um, <laughs> uh, what, so what, the, what this uh, the startup does is um, um, they're in the foreign exchange space. So imagine you have two banks called uh, Barclays and UBS. And they engage in a foreign exchange swap, uh, the U.S. dollar and the yuan. Um, so right now, they record all that on their own independent uh, databases. And so what they're using is they're using the blockchain as a triple entry accounting. So now, in addition to recording uh, this trade uh, in their own databases, there will be uh, an additional uh, entry into a blockchain database that says, you know, how much was transacted, the date, the time, the strike price, et cetera. And they both cryptographically sign it. And then if there's ever a dispute after the fact, they can look at this, you know, perfectly uh, auditable 
uh, ledger and determine, you know, sort of fix the, so it just creates a lot more security in the system. And, and those are easy to implement because you don't have to rip anything out. Uh, the pro, you just, you're adding on to the current system. Uh, the, I think the, the next wave, what we'll see are then moving towards uh, the, like the aforementioned digital bearer assets. Now, those are interesting because um, you hear a lot of talk about uh, reducing time to clearing and settlement. Um, and so what first, like what is clearing and settlement? Um, when, if I want to send, um, Sebastian, if I want to send, if we want to trade a uh, stock um, right now, what basically happens is I send you a message and says like, hey, I want to buy uh, the stock from you. And then you say, sure, okay. And then we engage in the clearing and settling process. Um, and we're, you know, moving assets from my bank to your clearinghouse, your bank, it's, it's a, and that's, it takes a few days to, uh, to complete that. But if you, in the world where you have a digital bearer asset, and so, um, and I have some sort of token of value, whether it's a Bitcoin or, um, you know, Clearmatics guys, and there's a few other talking about the settlement coin, which is basically just like loading some value into the system. Then we can just like atomically swap uh, your digital bearer asset that's your stock with with my value token of whatever kind, and boom, we just traded, and there there is no clearing and settlement because it just it just atomically swaps these um, these assets. So um, I think that's that's kind of, but that's going to take a lot more time because there's a lot that goes into that. There's a, like all of these systems are it's it's a hornet's nest diving into this stuff, and you have to uh, not only. The, the swap itself, but all the reporting mechanisms that go into it. And so, and, and it's, so I think it will come, it just will take longer. And then the third phase is getting more into the, the database plays with kind of just the broader um, community outside of finance. So that's kind of like how I see it in from a high level. Yeah, I think, I think it helps to have a little more context, at least in terms of, um, I mean, blockchains are really, I almost want to stop using the word blockchain because it's so it means so many things to so many people i mean it's like using the word god and having to have a re trying to have a reasonable conversation <laughs> at this point um it's like not possible but anyways like blockchains are it, it, what Bit bitcoin introduced two things one was this this data structure we call a blockchain which is really this combination of byzantine fault tolerance merkle trees for compact proofs of the state state-of-the-art you know public key signatures and peer-to-peer -peer networking, right? Um, there had always been peer-to-peer -peer networking. There had always been, you know, Byzantine fault tolerance, but they weren't all put together. The thing that made Bitcoin really take off was the fact that in addition to putting these things together, it had a unique solution to Byzantine fault tolerance, which was this economic solution where, you know, people pile blocks on each other and try to do the one with the most work. And, you know, it's a brilliant solution to Byzantine fault tolerance, but of course it involves all the economics. Now that we've gone down this road of, of seeing where Bitcoin can take us and they're starting to try and step backwards and, and deconstruct the, the Bitcoin stack and, and put it back into context, we realize that you know, this, this combination of, of these four pieces is very useful basically anywhere consensus systems are used. And consensus systems are ubiquitous. I mean, every major internet service on the planet today is using a, a consensus system at the bottom of their stack one way or another. Most of those are Paxos, which was the first really popular consensus system. It's not Byzantine fault tolerant. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people are, are switching to Raft, which is a new consensus system that came out a couple years ago, which is much easier to implement than Paxos and a lot easier to understand. So, and there's, there's a huge community around Raft. People are very excited about it and about using it. Uh, and we're seeing all kinds of new applications built on top. And you know, everyone is starting to use Raft as sort of their, their consensus layer. I think what's going to happen is in much the same way we're seeing that with Raft, we're going to start to see the same kind of thing with, with things like Tendermint and, and other blockchains, which are just combining PBFTs with the Merkle and the elliptic curves and the P2P for any internet service that needs to be replicated across multiple machines. I mean, whenever you're replicating data, you have some kind of consensus engine to do it. And in, the, in an age where you know, post Snowden world where trust has become so much more of an issue at the forefront, people are mistrusting of the government and finances and each other and, you know, the big bust in 2008 and all the, the lying and escaping of audit trails. As all that stuff becomes more like prevalent and prominent in culture, it's just going to further motivate the need to, to run, you know, BFT consensus algorithms rather than just consensus algorithms the same way 
you know, 30 years earlier, when we started having multiple network machines, it motivated the need to have a consensus algorithm at all, instead of just having it all in one machine, right? So I think it, it's kind of this, this natural transition in, in consensus itself, where we move from everything on one mainframe, to things distributed across multiple machines using something like Paxos, to things distributed across multiple machines using something like Tendermint and all the, the cryptography to make it auditable and traceable. And I, I think sort of re-engineering major pieces of society on top of that is going to go a long way towards um, having sort of, you know, better functioning democratic systems. Uh, one thing, one sort of quip I like to make is that, you know, people are always like, oh, why use a blockchain when you could just use MySQL because it's so much, it's so much more efficient, right? And I like to say, well, why bother with democracy when you could just have a dictatorship because it's so much more efficient, right? I mean, if you're a dictator, you just say what has to get done and then it gets done. Whereas democracy, you have to fuss about with all this nonsense of voting and so on. And ultimately, the reason, the reason democracy, I mean, democracy doesn't work as it's been implemented now, we all know, but, you know, theoretical democracy. Um, the reason it's this powerful thing that we all sort of strive for is because over the long term, it leads to a much greater efficiency in terms of, you know, sustainability and quality of life than a dictatorship ever could. And I think this sort of progression in in consensus technology is moving in the same direction from, you know, this the monolithic everything on one machine towards these non-Byzantine fault tolerant trusted consensus algorithms towards real Byzantine fault tolerant ones with cryptographic audit trails. And I can just see, you know, everything being repositioned on top of that by virtue of the fact that almost everything needs to be replicated across uh, multiple machines. And uh, especially the thing that, that gets me really excited, you know, is the, when we talk about what I mentioned in my introduction, um, self or self emergence and self organization in physical systems, that's what let me led me to Bitcoin in the first place, because it's like the self organizing, you know, internet system. Uh, what really gets me excited is about the applicability of this kind of stuff to government, or as we call it now government, right? Um, and, and the way that the transparency and auditability and participation and feedback loops are going to be so much better, um, so much more fluid and so much more functional in systems running on top of, on top of, uh, Byzantine fault tolerant, you know, cryptographically auditable consensus networks. And, and that, and that's the kind of thing that, that you know, that, that, I get out of bed in the morning and I'm just, you know, excited to overthrow the government and replace it with a government. Uh, yeah, well, you know, tell us tell us a bit more about this, about this project. Uh, sure. So yeah, so along along that route, we've started building a TMSP app that we're calling Government, um, you know, M I N T, and it's it's a very very simple. What we're trying to do is establish the the absolute most basic pieces we need for a, a self upgradable governance policy over the internet. Um, so. You know the way the way it starts now is it's just a it's just an application for proposing things and voting on those proposals, um, and the the proposals can be you know arbitrary proposals that the protocol knows nothing about and you know have everything to do with uh, you know things happening offline, or well, and some of them can be related to the protocol itself. Um, so maybe you have a proposal that you wanna you wanna upgrade the app, right? Maybe there's some new feature you want. Uh, and instead of coding it in from the beginning, you make a proposal within the app to upgrade the whole app to include this new feature. And so over time, people can upgrade, you know, in many different directions and, and end up with, um, you know, government applications that are sort of suited for them rather than up front us trying to build the ultimate government application and have everyone try and use that. We're trying to build something very basic that people can upgrade according you know, to their own their own needs and and voting voter preferences over time, and we're hoping to use that um, to actually manage live blockchains and validator sets. So, for example, something like validator set changes, we could use this this so called board. You know, it's like it's almost like the validators or the people make up a board, a board of directors or something. They vote using this app, which runs on the blockchain, and it can have a trigger so that they can vote to add new validators, remove validators, change some rule whatever the case may be. And over time, you get this, this sort of, you know, self-emergent governance model, uh, starting with very basic building blocks. Uh, and I, I think there's a, a lot of potential for that kind of approach. And we're going to see more and more of that uh, moving forward. One, one area we're moving towards is what kind of, um, I know we're kind of short on time here. So one, just one 
point to get in before we go is uh, the, the high level business model is that we're giving away uh, free tools, resources um, to, to build blockchains. Uh, and then the business model comes in in terms of uh, having, uh, creating um, proprietary tools for deploying and monitoring uh, blockchains. Now, some of those will open source as well, but um, that's, uh, there's, a, there's a big market in terms of um, a lot of problems to be solved that um, people haven't even really begun thinking through in terms of the deployment and management of blockchains. And, uh, you know, we have, a, we have a pretty, already in our short history, have uh, shown a, a great uh, uh, track record for solving big problems in the industry, whether it's through consensus itself, um, through um, the refactoring with TMSP, um, through now um, with the deployment uh, with MintNet. And uh, there's lots of other really intriguing things that we're going to be uh, launching and announcing here in the coming uh, months. So stay tuned. Cool. Uh, well, I, I'm really looking forward to this uh, government uh, uh, idea, and you know maybe this could be a topic for an entire other episode because I think uh, there's quite a bit to talk about there. Um, and uh, you mentioned earlier that you guys were uh, raising funds. Can you want, want, want to mention that? Yes. Yep. Yep. We uh, we've been very much in the code don't talk uh, kind of phase of existence here, and so we've had our heads down. Uh, working uh, uh, for the last, uh, since, well, I guess Jay's been working on this for a year and a half quite heavily, uh, Ethan for the past year or so, and I've been for three or four months, and uh, now we're really ready to kind of let the world know what it is that we've been working on and where we're going, uh, and part of that also is kicking off our fundraise, and so we are doing a, a pre-seed round right now, and uh, so far the uh, uh, the reception on all fronts has been quite strong, both from you know developers to investors to um, enterprise clients. Um, so it's, uh, I think 2016, 2016 is going to be a good year for Tendermint. I'm sure it will be. And uh, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to diving in deeper and, and perhaps even working with you guys because um, we, we have been looking at Tendermint at Stratum as, as one of the one of our sort of bro- private blockchain solutions that we want to implement. So uh, uh, we'll be looking. Look we'll, it, we'll, we'll, we'll be looking uh, closely at Um Well, thanks a lot, guys, for joining us today. It was a really fascinating discussion uh, about Thank you. some really fascinating technology. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have to dive in deeper, I think, into this government uh, idea uh, at some other at some point. So thank you for joining us. And uh, episode of Bitcoin is part of the LTB network. You can go to letstalkbitcoin.com to find a whole bunch of shows about Bitcoin, blockchain technologies, cryptocurrencies, a whole bunch of other stuff. We release episodes of Epicenter Bitcoin every Monday, except for sometimes when we have little issues, as you've noticed recently. Uh, but usually it's Mondays. And you can subscribe to Epicenter Bitcoins on iTunes, SoundCloud, um, or wherever you get your podcast could be on a on a podcatcher app on Android or iTunes, and you can also get the videos on YouTube at youtubecom slash BTC. And if you're a loyal listener and you appreciate the show, you can always leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere else that you can leave us reviews. I'm not really sure um, where else, but anyway, Stitcher or some other platform. If you do so, send us an email at show at epicenterbitcoin.com and we will send you a t-shirt and some stickers and many thanks. Uh, so of course, you can always leave us a tip and the uh, tipping address will be in the show description. So thank you so much and we look forward to being back next week. Thank you.